This is people who are paying thousands of dollars for lab testing. Yep. And that is quite extreme. And then on the other end, you have people where you don't need any lab testing. You're treating the patient, not the lab values. A couple of other red flags, um, and these are interesting because they're on two complete ends of the spectrum. So you have uh, providers who order every single test. So this isn't like a you know, two or three hundred dollar panel. This is people who are paying thousands of dollars for lab testing. Yep. And that is quite extreme. And then on the other end, you have people where you don't need any lab testing. You're treating the patient, not the lab values. Um, we had some fun this morning taking some hormone quizzes uh, because this is supposedly a way to tell whether you have a cortisol issue or a testosterone issue, or an estrogen issue, or a progesterone issue. Um, you know, I'm sure there's ones out there for other hormones like serotonin and dopamine as well. Yeah. Uh, but it was really interesting. What happened whenever you and I took the test and answered it differently? Yeah, so we got the exact same result when uh, you take the test, when I took the test, when my wife took the test. Um, very different situations, but the exact same result. The result is just uh, take my quiz, which if you answer it carefully, that could take a solid five minutes. And they give you an email to buy their program with no information whatsoever. This is infuriating, and really it's not acceptable because. It is a, it's advertising the quiz almost like a PHQ-9 or a GAD-7. And it's like, this is a service. Or an, they could have at least put an Adam or an Eve questionnaire there. Mm -hmm. and Something validated. Yeah. And it's just trying to play into the sunk cost fallacy, which you've already sunk five minutes of your time into this. So you might as well just pay my small fee and... Um, get my program that tells my you to e stop course. eating. Yeah, to, yeah, it's gonna tell you to stop eating meat, so. <laughs> yeah, and I, I actually went back and did this a second time. I said, well, I'm gonna, the only thing I'm going to click this entire quiz is high cholesterol. And turns out I had hormone dysfunction and I needed to take the course still. So yeah, very disappointing. And I think this is, even if you had like a validated questionnaire there, say it's an Adam or an Eve, uh, the Adam questionnaire, like if someone has sleep apnea or hypothyroidism, they're going to hit some of those marks and be like, oh, look, the quiz says you have low testosterone. When in reality, the lab testing may show subclinical or true clinical hypothyroidism, or they could have signs of sleep apnea, insulin resistance, they snore, they stop breathing in their sleep, they have an elevated red blood cell count. Those are things, you know, it should be a diagnosis of exclusion, not like take this test and then, okay, here's the treatment. Yeah. And most validated tool questionnaires are that way. By the way, validated tools are usually validated against things like biobanks. This is something that you know has um, been studied well. And usually if it's screening, you want there to be high sensitivity and relatively low cost. Now there's Obviously, other things that are not screening that do not have those two things, and they can be applicable. But if you think about uh, PHQ-9, um, if you don't have depression or mood disorder and you're just in bereavement, you're probably going to have a really high PHQ-9, and that's okay. You see your healthcare provider or perhaps even your therapist, and um, they're able to discern, yes, that would be um, not due to depression, but due to bereavement. Yeah, it's almost like you need to have a thorough history that's taken around the answers of a quiz before you can tell someone what the treatment would be or whether this is something that would deviate back to the mean because you're under a lot of stress. Another, yeah. I guess, red flag in health information. Um, so this is very popular now. There's a lot of health experts and experts in the social media field. And if you see a you know, a blog post or a reel or a podcast such as this, you ideally would want there to be a number of citations given for the information that was provided because people can and do make things mm -hmm. up all the time. And sometimes yep. those are true. Sometimes they're not. Um, we do our best to include citations. We're probably not perfect at that because uh, we have 
thousands of studies swirling around our head at all times, but we do try to add a lot of references and citation to the material that we put out, especially where needed, where it's not an accepted standard of care. Like at, the, mm. at this point, and actually I think we do give a lot of citation. We did earlier today for APOB, even though yep. we didn't need to. That's an <laughs> accepted standard of care in medicine. Another red flag would be too many citations. You see a lot of individuals who do not practice evidence-based medicine and they have a bunch of citations, usually in the form of I don't know why, but they like to put the PMID numbers. Sometimes I do that too. And it links to a bunch of rodent studies or even um, in vitro studies. And that is another red flag because they're masquerading behind the, um, behind pretending to be evidence-based medicine, but it's not clinically applicable. Yeah. And this can even happen in, like the references can even be misrepresented. So they can misunderstand a study Intentionally or unintentionally, and this can even happen in scientific literature. I think sometimes you will go back and come through literature and you'll see a reference and then you'll go see, okay, what this has like a one sentence that's referring to this reference. Let's see a little bit more of information about that. And then you find out that that's actually not what was seen in the study at all. I believe this was the case in um, a lot of the research we we're doing surrounding Tan Ket Ali. Um, yep. acting as a, you know, an aromatase, aromatase inhibitor, inhibitor or a CIRM. Yep. And we, you know, based on the literature that's out there and then, you know, most recent study I'm aware of, there was an increase in both testosterone and, and estradiol estrogen. in men. So it doesn't seem to have a significant effect on aromatase in terms of reducing that. Mm-hmm. So th- this isn't just in social media messaging. There's a, a standard that isn't always upheld even in scientific literature. It's the same thing with DIM. There is a physician that wrote a book for a company that discussed how DIM is an aromatase inhibitor. And that also does not appear to be the case. So uh, a lot of slippery slope. And that was in a a book that was written with citations. Citations, you say? Yeah, the false citations. (laughs) 